Welcome everybody to one more talks at Google. Today's edition is NASA at Google. Thanks to our little NASA and Ames Research Center Relation Group, Wave Guys. Uh, today's guest is uh, Ms. Deva Newman. She's the Deputy Administrator of uh, the National Aerospace uh, Agency. Uh, I was watching yesterday a documentary on YouTube, uh, you know, like sort of preparing myself for this talk, uh, knowing that Deva has worked on spacesuits. And I was thinking, you know, like having like, followed the, the space program for many years and you know, like having a lot of knowledge about the Apollo program. Well, what were the you know, like most most challenging things to solve? And you know, like I've read many books. I read a book about you know like how the KSC was put together, the Kennedy Space Center. I mean, it was a huge logistical uh, nightmare. I read you know like uh, a book about you know like the crawler. You know like how difficult you know like we solved that problem. It was first thought you know like oh we'll do it with barges. Then somebody saw this big, you know, like equipment moving Earth, uh, actually coal, somewhere, and said, "Oh, well, maybe we should try that." Uh, you know, like guidance to the moon uh, that was solved at MIT. That was a huge challenge as well, although it had some roots at least uh, in, you know, like World War II efforts. But the the thing that I think, you know, like were truly uh, the the challenges are, you know, like the thing that gets the rocket up, which is the rocket engine, and you know, like after all, it is called rocket science. And, but you know, like, if you look today, I think we pretty much nailed that problem. I mean, you know, like on, on the space shuttle program, we have now we had our rockets that can throttle, that can change uh, uh, the impulse. Uh, but the other piece that I thought was really remarkable uh, and, and very very hard was the spacesuit, and it's completely unappreciated. You know, like I mean, it's like hey, what's you know, it's just a suit, right? It's like we have divers and whatnot. But it is, uh, you know, like when you when you read about it, there's books uh, out. Uh, there's actually a talk also on Google Talks about the space suit itself. Uh, there's also documentaries out there. It's, you know, like it it makes the difference. It makes a complete difference in a program. I mean, you know, like what's the point of sending humans to the moon or sending humans to Mars if you're gonna keep them in a tin can? If if they can't do any, you know, like what humans do, you know, like walk around and you know, like do do things the way humans do it. So. You know, like watch that on YouTube. Uh, I'm gonna go with the introduction to David Newman, but this is truly something that she has contributed at NASA as well. So Dr. David Newman was nominated by President Barack Obama in January 2015 and confirmed by the US Senate uh, in April 2015 to serve as the Deputy Administrator of the National Aeronautics and Space Administration. Prior to her tenure with NASA, Newman was the Apollo Program Professor of Aeronautics at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, MIT, in Cambridge. Ms. Newman's expertise is in multidisciplinary research encompassing aerospace biomedical engineering. Her latest research efforts included advanced space suit design, dynamics and control of astronaut motion, socio-technical systems analysis, and space policy. Also ongoing efforts in assistive and wearable technologies to augment human locomotion here on Earth. David Newman is the author of Interactive Aerospace Engineering and Design, an introductory engineering textbook published by McGraw-Hill in 2002. She has also published more than 250 papers in journals and referred conferences. She has served on numerous National Academy studies and panels on human space flight, human robotic interaction, and active learning for engineering and design and education. Please join me in welcoming uh, Deva Newman to Google. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Great to be here. Hello, everyone. Good morning or, or afternoon. Thank you for coming. So uh, we'd just like to uh, share uh, our vision for the future of uh, human space exploration, and as well as uh, leave a lot of questions for, for q and I'm, I'm joined today uh, with uh, NASA Ames colleagues, uh, Dr. Eugene Tu, the director is here, and, and Terry Fong is, is here. And um, we have seven, on my count, uh, seven partnerships right now with, with Google and NASA. And so we're really uh, glad to work with you and partner with you, and um, we're always better together. And uh, as I say, it's kind of the, the new NASA since I've been in government the last year. It's been my, my privilege and, and pleasure. But uh, we're just asking, how can we partner creatively? How can we get things done? And uh, this is all about... Uh, 
really, for me, the human spirit and exploration and uh, raising ourselves, see what, what, the, what potential do we have as humanity. humanity. And I think it's uh, making people interplanetary. So with that, tell you some highlights. Highlights in the last year. Um, it's the 26th anniversary of Hubble. So everyone in here, 26 or younger, raise your hand. It's a lot of you guys, fantastic. Your entire life, the Hubble Space Telescope, are the world's greatest optical telescope obser observatory, has been up there. And it's only in low Earth orbit. But we've looked back 13 billion light years. So these are our enduring questions. Are there other habitable planets? Is there life out there? And then was there past life ever on Mars? So my favorite story about Hubble is there was a really dark spot in the sky, and we had never seen it, right? So put up your thumbs. The thumbnail, your thumbnail. We looked at that really dark spot in the sky. Does anyone know what we found? Galaxies. Hmm? Galaxies. Galaxies. 3,000 new galaxies. So just amazing. Really actually hard. I think I'm pretty good with orders of magnitude, but that just kind of blows my mind. And uh, so celebrating Hubble, it's a really great. There's a many uh, more. It's uh, James Webb, or JWST. It's NASA, it's acronyms. You guys have a lot of Google acronyms as well. Uh, so James Webb is going to launch in 2018. It's 100 times uh, more powerful. Dr. Mather, that's our Nobel laureate, tells me. He's the PI. 18 really amazing, you know, adaptive. Um, now, this is an infrared. Uh, so, so this is an uh, infrared telescope. And its purpose is, again, help us with these enduring questions. Dark energy, dark matter. You know, what's 96% of the stuff that we don't know? So looking again for the beginnings and the origins um, of the solar system. So again, James Webb coming uh, at you and launching on an Ariane 5. Again, look at our international uh, partnerships. We lots of international science um, on board that we, we welcome, we seek. How many of you know about New Horizons last year? Thank you. Pluto, I count dwarf planets. I'm an aerospace engineer. So uh, we didn't know what it looked like. It was fuzzy. We had never seen it. We had never been there. Um, Pretty amazing to zoom in on Pluto. It has a heart. I like that part. Um, got to tweet it, you know, for Valentine's. It's just amazing. So now we know what it's made out of, icy. You know, and who knew Pluto would have mountains in this structure? Uh, anyone heard about our Dawn spacecraft? It's wonderful. Just won the Collier Trophy. We're so proud of this team. So Dawn, hmm, it's orbiting another dwarf planet called Ceres. It's in between Mars, Jupiter, into the, in the asteroid belt. And it's been twinkling at us. And we didn't know what those shiny spots were, so we zoomed in on it. And we actually just, uh, looks like there's some, some deposits, some sodium deposits. We really zoomed in on it in just last December. That's Ahuna Mons. Move over, Mount Everest. Ahuna Mons is five kilometers tall, 20 kilometers wide. And we see some reflections, and we see these reflections, these high-intensity reflections coming, coming at us from, um, from Ceres. And again, maybe sodium and other deposits that we're seeing. But really amazing. Um, who would have thought, for a planet, that there would ever be this type of um, you know, mountain on, on Ceres? Not us when we you know, started the, the mission. So exploring the, the solar system and beyond is what we're, we're all about uh, with our probes. Where will you be on 4th of July? Here, fireworks, big fireworks in, in the Bay Area. I hope so. Well, we're really happy because uh, everyone's throwing a big party for us. We're glad for all the fireworks. We get to Jupiter on July 4th. Good timing, huh? We go into our, we're, we're inserting our orbit. It's, um, gosh, Eugene, what is it? 18 days. 18 days and counting. So we are, we've been going since 2011, but we will get to our closest point in the orbit July 4th. And um, just an amazing mission. It's the largest, most complicated solar-powered probe ever in the, in, to go into the, the solar system. So, you know, this is really off the grid. <laughs> it's way out there. And uh, one of my favorite things about it is JunoCam sends back HD images. And we're saying, hey, world, it's our largest effort to date in citizen science. Where do you want to explore? Tell us where to point JunoCam. You tell us. So we're really trying to bring uh, the world with us, to bring all of you with us, you know, into exploration. And so that's just a really exciting. OSIRIS-REx, anyone heard of OREx? It's the first time we're going. No one's heard of OREx? What are you guys doing, working too hard here at Google? Come on, get on our NASA website. It's, uh, it's pretty amazing. We're going to an asteroid, uh, Bennu, well, Bennu, and um, we will launch in September. And then, of course, it takes a, a few years to you know, do the whole mission. I think in 2023, we get the sample back. So, but it'll be our first uh, asteroid sample return. 
Uh, great mission. Okay, since you guys, you Googlers, have been working so hard, uh, what about flowing water on Mars? You know this happened? Thank, all right, there you go. Um, huge, scientifically huge. We knew there was ice on the polar caps, but water, seasonal water, so we're studying this, we're looking uh, again this season, and um, watch this. We th Mars has 1% carbon dioxide atmosphere, so what happened to Mars's atmosphere? We've been wondering about that for a long time. We have five landers and orbiters at Mars today. And this one's from MAVEN. Simulation. Uh, solar winds, these are the solar winds. And this is literally the ions being ablated off of Mars. Mars has no global magnetic field. Unlucky for Mars, real lucky for Earth. <laughs> Our uh, magnetic uh, shield is really important. So in real time, but the papers are just being uh, written now about you know Mars's atmosphere and what could have happened to Mars. Um, why are we so fascinated with Mars? Uh, Mars and Earth, 4.5 billion years old each, sister planets. Mars is really far away. It's really hard to get to. Again, we've been doing this for 50 years uh, with with uh, you know landers and orbiters, but again now. We ha perhaps know how um, the evidence of maybe how Mars lost its atmosphere. Because we think 3.5 billion years ago, Mars was wet, wonderful, could have ha uh, harbored life, and then what went, ter what went so terribly wrong? That's really important for us to learn for, for Earth. All of our exploring, I like to say, just teaches us about uh, spaceship Earth. I, Earth is my number one planet. <laughs> Mars is my second favorite planet. <laughs> um, but make no mistake about you know our, our home planet and spaceship Earth. So. Gosh, anyone here 16 or under? I got all the 26 years old. Okay, exactly. You guys have really smart high school interns. Um, so for their entire life, and I call them the Mars generation. You know, the young, the folks in college and high school today, they are a Mars generation because they're the ones who are gonna be the explorers of Mars. But 16 years, so this is phase one of our journey to Mars, which I'll tell you more about. But 16 years, international, we're working with um, 15 other countries, five major partners, amazing. How many, how many of you know about our big rocket? A few, all right. This is not just for PowerPoints, take a look. Um, it's serious and it's being well constructed today. This is a fun video. It's SLS, our space launch system. This gets us beyond low Earth orbit. First to lunar orbit, deep space, in the 2020s, and then 2030s onward to Mars. We're investing in a thousand companies across every state in the US to get this done. It's the coolest stir friction welding machine ever. Get our, that's a Mishu uh, assembly building in out, just out of uh, New Orleans. Okay, that's animation, but we've been testing. This is the animation part, but the rocket's real. These are the real engines. We've been firing them and testing them. That's at our Stennis Space Center to test the, do the static fares. Uh, the solids have been tested in Utah. Has the Orion capsule on top. That's the Orion capsule. The European support module ring around it you just saw. Entry, descent, and landing, that's a tough problem. That's a huge, huge challenge for us, We're for a human mission. So that's a good day in the office, right? We drop things out of planes and test them. <laughs> a lot of sensors. <laughs> So that's what we call EM-1, Exploration Mission 1, uh, 2018 will launch. It'll be followed shortly by EM-2, Exploration Mission 2, which will be the first one with astronauts on board. EM-1 uh, has the Orion capsule, and, and then the second mission has the astronauts on board. So uh, it's pretty fun. It's pretty great. We've never been under this much development in the last uh, four decades um, you know, to do development of Space Launch System, development of Orion. These are major, major development programs for us. And... Uh, 
show you this. As I said, we've been on Mars for 50 years. We've been exploring Mars with our rovers. So this is the highlights for you. You can raise your hand when you're born, 65. Some of us are, Eugene and I, we can't. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> No, there's a there's a big time delay between Earth and Mars, right? So we really call these like the moments of terror. You know, you're waiting to get the signals back. So boy, when uh, there's a successful mission in landing, you are really psyched. Okay, now you guys are all born. All right. Hopefully, you remember some of these missions. We land every way you can possibly land to to test out, you know, airbags to cranes to retro rockets. So we call that MRO, still giving us incredible data today. There's dust devils on Mars too, that's real. The Martian didn't just make that up. We have a whole bunch of them. Curiosity, we have an yeah. Extraordinary men and women of NASA in our Jet Propulsion Laboratory. Right now, the wheels of curiosity have begun to blaze the trail for human footprints on Mars. I want to call and say congratulations to the entire Mars Science Laboratory team and the overall JPL. We actually did a remarkable job. This is Maven that I showed you the data from. Our next big rover, Mars 2020. That's our future. So I say boots on Mars, uh, successfully with people, big challenges. And um, so our journey to Mars, uh, we have a plan. Uh, please download it, take it, you know. It's clear, it's concise, it's uh, really audacious, it's tough. Uh, but again, we uh, think that's the right thing to do for NASA to lead and for the US to lead. And we are looking for all kind of partners, specifically, you know, public private uh, industry folks and international folks. We're all in saying, you know, here are our plans and, and it's global exploration. No one nation, no one space agency does this alone. We're saying, you know, these are the pieces we're committed to. This is what we can do, we can sustain, we can afford, and then, hey world, what do you want to do? And so phase one, uh, space station, we've been there for 16 years. We're gonna keep, we'll be on space station till 2024, but then parallel, space launch system, you know, the 20 space launch system, Orion, we're in Sisu Lunar, we call that the proving ground to really make the technology investments that we need. And then phase three is, is onward to, to Mars. So that's our, our plan. We are charged uh, by the president to in, get humans to, to Mars orbit and then boots on Mars in the coming decades. And uh, I'd like to say, it's not something that just keeps moving out and moving out. We're closer than we've ever been in humanity to sending people to, to Mars. So it's really, you know, like I said, the metal is being built. We're investing in all these systems. So really amazing. It's still out there to the 2030s, but that's not too far because, you know, we're making progress and we're making these investments to stay with this vision and stay with this focus. Um, who knows about our one year in space? Scott Kelly, great. And uh, he just came back and he's a little sore. It's two months down, we're just, just with him. His feet hurt. His feet hurt, you know. Uh, we're still really looking at the physiological effects psychological effects and the physiology. We have to, we keep looking at this, and there's about 35, 36 uh, biomedical kind of human risk factors. We're down to the top three or so, really trying to make sense of it. Uh, gave us the first time to do uh, our genomics in space. His identical twin brother, Mark, as you know, former astronaut down here on ground, the control with Scott up there. So we're just doing the DNA sequencing now. I can't wait for the data coming out in the next months, the next six months. Uh, the, we already know the microbiome from Scott in weightlessness is, comp is very changed, radically altered. So um, great mission, uh, 
nothing like, right, this is just at lunchtime, this talk, so, you know, make you guys hungry. First time we get to eat anything you can eat fresh in space is a good day. This is our veggie experiment, so there's Shell Lundgren and, and uh, Scott Harvesting with, with a Japanese colleague, and uh, a little salad, you know, veggie's kind of small, it's veggie three. Just uh, some of the technologies, the way I like to explain it is, here's Mars, we have our Mars requirements, and then we back it down. What can we do in the 2020s in deep space? What can we do today on space station? What are those essential Mars requirements? Technology and the human, you know, and the physiology and the human health astronaut performance. Here's just some of the technologies then that we're testing in microgravity and we're investing in. Um, how do you refuel? What about habitable structures? Do you know Beam just got expanded, right? It, we're, it's there for two years, taking data. We we need that data because we have to think about deep space habitats. And you can see there's a humanoid robotics. There's EVA systems. We talked about all kinds of the fire, fire in space. Not that I recommend it, but it's really cool in terms of the physics, right? <laughs> you don't have convection and things. It's a blue flame, right? It's not being fed. So um, actually, a fire experiment is going up on the next cargo cargo launch. Manufacturing, later on was, you know, we're working with uh, private industry, you know, to do manufacturing. We have our, our second uh, 3D printer up on space station today. So I asked um, Scott, I tweet, you can follow me at, at uh, Deva Explorer. So I asked Scott what he thought we should, you know, what technology do you think we really needed to work on for station? And yeah, I think the uh, life support systems that, that <laughs> we need to keep us alive in space are uh, ideal candidates for for demonstrations for our future journey to Mars, as well as as well as uh, space space suits, we need I think new spacesuit technology that I didn't uh, plant it, Boris. I didn't know you were going to say that. <laughs> uh, in space, and uh, you know something that's easy, going to be easier to work in on the surface under the uh, the Martian gravity. Right, and maybe he's a little biased because he probably knows my my background. But again, we're really trying to say, you know, what what are these pushes? What are, what do we have to invest in so that we're ready? We we will we'll be ready. And uh, we have to be strategic about that. Uh, again, wanted to, to make sure um, this is really incredible. Um, now NASA is, we're buying services. They're not all of ours, right? SpaceX and Orbital ATK, they're bringing our cargo up. We're so glad to kind of, you know, again, look at the, look at a new space and what's possible. Because um, we want to go further out and further out. And so we're very glad and turn that over to industry. And also Russia, you see there, Russia is, sending up cargo and our astronauts at this point. And then uh, that's the Japanese, that's JAXA, that's the HTV. So also cargo coming up from Japan. Again, we're all in this together. We want everyone to succeed. That's, that's where we're placing our bets. We need everyone to succeed to, to get this done. And um, you probably know in the future then our commercial crew, SpaceX and Boeing, will be sending our astronauts up. They'll be sending our astronauts up just in over a year. We'll do the testing, uh, testing out in 2017, and they'll be sending our astronauts up hopefully early 2018. Uh, that makes us um, not dependent um, right now on the, on the Russians, which we are. So really investing in, in American uh, US economy to get that done. We want to return launches back, back here to the US. So really, I look at space station the entire space station and our, this entire phase one as the experiment itself. I look at it as that's the experiment. So that's how I like to vision is it's actually maybe kind of think of it as the analog, the habitat analog. Now it's really huge and wonderful and as big as a football field, whether you like, you know, real football or American football, anyhow, good thing is they're same, same size of fields. That's how big station is. Um, and we're not sending anything like this to Mars. But the experience and the analog and living and you know working in these extreme environments is the experiment that, that tells us how we can go forward. And I'd like to, I hope you guys can see this, just an infographic. Uh, you saw the video that had 50 years of being on Mars, but I only showed you the successes. <laughs> so truth in advertising here, it's hard. It's really far away. So the, the orange, red, red lines, that's, a, that's the former Soviet Union and, and Russia. The blue are uh, the US and, and NASA attempts. Hey, we just tried to fly by. And then we had to, can we orbit Mars? Can we land? And you saw that, well, the green checks, you know, that's when we nailed it. That's when we hit it. But try, try, try. You know, that's what it's all about. You have to keep trying. And I kind of blew up, you know, in the last 10 years, now really the last 15 years, man, we've been nailing it. And you see Europe there, and you see the US and with Russia's help. And then you see the green line, India, first attempt. You know, so again, when anyone succeeds, we succeed. We provide them our deep space network, and we helped and we did the navigation, because we want everyone to succeed. That's, that's in all of our interests, is you know, how do we do this together? And ExoMars, which is the European Space Agency mission launched um, out of Russia, it's en route to Mars today. Again, there's five you know, rovers and vehicles there 
We're learning every day. Did you guys check the weather on Mars before you came today? I check it every morning. It's beautiful. You're spoiled. I mean, it's beautiful California sunny weather. I used to live here. I remember this. Well, it's cold on Mars today. It was like freezing, a couple degrees below freezing. It's always cold on Mars. Um, and in the 2020s, what we're doing is we, you know, our robotic precursor missions, they keep going. They necessarily keep going. So we get data every day. We get a lot of data back from, from Mars to get ready. So here's uh, some icons of what we need to figure out in the 2020s with our precursors. We'll be in deep space. Again, this is kind of now all in parallel. And um, EDL, entry, descent, and landing. You saw it in the movie, coming in hot. Um, we don't know how to do that. We know how to do it for one metric ton, right? Our rovers. Two metric tons, OK, maybe it scales one to two metric tons. 10, 20 metric tons, we got to figure that out. we got to figure that out. So a lot of, you know, a lot of research. We really, you know, coming in hot. Mars that has a 1% atmosphere, it's just a nuisance. It doesn't help at all. Air, you know, it doesn't, that's not enough drag to slow us down. It doesn't help at all. So really, um, coming in hot, now we have humans on board. So this is a big challenge for us, entry, descent, landing. You know, when we're on the, on the surface, what about in situ resource utilization? All exploration, successful exploration in humanity, people live off the land. They make use of the resources. You don't take everything with you. So we have to figure this out. You know, when you go camping across California or the US, guess what? You need those fuel depots, right? You need those caches. You have your caches out when you go camping. So how do we, how do, we do that? You know, we're thinking of that mentality. How do you really get it right? How do you have um, maybe the fuel um, methane? Looks like Mars has even more methane than we ever thought, right? Hey, methane makes good propulsion. So, you know, all these are really research areas for us about, you know, fuel and all the things, the human, robotic, the, you know, all the, hopefully all of the things that you guys are so smart at and work on and all these, the autonomous, the autonomous systems uh, are critical, critical. I can't overstate the importance of the criticality of when we get to Mars, it's so far away, you have to be completely Earth independent. We've never done that before. Completely Earth independent. The proving ground, you're days to weeks away from help in an emergency or to get resupplies. But not, not so it's a really different paradigm when we, when we really get to Mars. So our you know, precursors will be helping. This is just a shout out. Again, um, one fun thing at NASA, I get to be in charge of partnerships. And there's over 700 of them. We work with 120 nations. So it's much easier to say who we're not working with. Um, so just a big celebration. We're, we're all in, you know, and we're looking for partners and, and some um, different, different countries, emerging countries that just want to be part of it. And we're saying absolutely. Uh, Mars 2020 is up on the left. That's, a, again, the next, next big rover. Just, a, just great cooperation. Has this really cool experiment on board. Well, they're all cool experiments. They're all fantastic. But MOXIE, it's going to make oxygen. So we're going to make oxygen the first time on a, on a planet. And uh, it splits off the carbon. Since Mars is CO2 atmosphere, it splits off the carbon atoms, and we are left with oxygen. Now, not enough for a person to survive on, but it's a start. You know, first time we can make oxygen on another planet. And let's see. Um, I wouldn't, you know, I'm here at NASA Ames, right, our center that it leads in across the spectrum. But uh, we've got to give a shout out. I am an aerospace engineer. so. Let me tell you, uh, flight is very exciting. And uh, just, I can't tell you, we just have a new aviation um, horizons, a huge initiative. Hopefully, the next 10 years, uh, we'll get, invest $3.5 billion into, into aeronautics and aviation. And this is the best example, I think, of what the government does, what NASA does, putting in the research and development. So, up top, that's our low boom supersonic demonstrator. Just got back from uh, Europe. I sure wish it was three hours or four hours, not the eight hours, right? I just flew in uh, last night here. Man, that would have been a great two hour flight, right? Um, so it's low boom, it, continental US, so it has to be like a thump, the super sign. We can do it mostly through uh, geometry and moving the, the shock back and, and off. And uh, just announced uh, Friday, the little guy on the bottom is actually a hybrid electric. So hybrid electric air, air flight, you know, coming to you. And again, we'll hand it over, and then the commercial folks will hopefully commercialize it. Just again, it's really our best example. In the middle, these are ultra efficient, 50% fuel reduction, and 50% um, noise reduction. So those are kind of like our eco, our eco airplanes, our ultra efficient airplanes. So this is a, we're back in the business of X plane, experimental aircraft demonstrators. It's incredibly exciting, incredibly exciting for us. Okay, so I'm gonna um, come full circle uh, back to Earth, as I said, my, my favorite planet. And uh, I don't know if you know about our Discover mission. I hope you do. Um, download the app because you get to look at, you get to use these beautiful images every day. Now, um, Earth, uh, Sun, 
Lagrangian points, I love a technical audience, right? You guys probably actually know what L1 is. <laughs> Most, so uh, it's this beautiful place in between Earth and, uh, Earth and Sun, and it's uh, gravity neutral. So it's a really good place to hang out. So Discover is hanging out, and I just describe it as um, our solar system weather buoy. So all that solar wind and solar radiation, Discover is measuring that and saying, hey, Earth, here's what's coming your way since it's out there, you know, at L1. And uh, then every month you get to see, this is, oh, you guys are gonna like this. If you're my age. <laughs> How many hours of grad school, right, did you study? <laughs> <laughs> Doesn't everyone listen to Pink Floyd? Now my 26 and unders? Okay, all right, I got a few, I got a few. <laughs> um, well, thanks for, uh, um, but they got it wrong. It's, there's not a dark side of the moon. It's the far side. It's the far side of the moon. It's, it's nice and lit. We just haven't been there, but now Discover is showing us uh, what the far side of the moon uh, looks like. So again, in all that reflecting, I, um, we have over 20 Earth science uh, observing satellites. We just say eyes in the sky, but we're pointed right down on Earth. So um, I just found out about you know, Santa Barbara, forest fires happening. You know, last month we were, we just, we point our eyes when Canada, when the great forest fires now in Canada will be, will be a busy summer, unfortunately. You know, what resources, what assets do we have uh, to look at the earth? Um, looking at ocean, looking at ocean sea rise, right? Melting, temperature, all this, what all the, our earth set. And now NASA, what we do, we design and build and fly the satellites. We hand them over to our sister agencies, you know, NOAA and USGS, and we work together really well for all this earth science data. And um, don't need to convince this crowd, but let me show you a century. Uh, it's in Celsius. Um, blue is lower than average, one or two degrees, and yellow is one degree Celsius above two. Uh, I mean, dark red is two degrees Celsius above average. So take a look at, can I raise your hand when you're born? Woo! Come on, 70s, you guys there? All right. So. 2015, hottest year in recorded history. 2016, we just got the data back from May, hottest month of recorded. You know, guess what my prediction is for 2016? So, um, you know, that's just the data. I'm not interpreting it. You can, <laughs> this is pretty amazing, pretty amazing, uh, again. So uh, it's just critical and it's uh, essential. Take a look at this. So um, I wanna leave you, my last few little slides for fun here. I spent my whole career on STEM education. Uh, again, isn't this what a rocket scientist looks like? You know, uh, I think maybe not. So I've turned it into steamed and add a uh, rich, rich gold. Maybe some of you guys ever had the pleasure to meet him. Uh, I think it's really the art science access has been worked a lot. Um, I think it's really important. I love that literature. But I think as you know, as an engineer, I think maybe the design engineering access we need to. If we really looked at this holistically, you know, we have big problems to help uh, solve for humanity. Right? Uh, water, climate, exploration. Again, all this, I think, if it, we'd be best served to, you know, we're all in. So for the artists, um, you know, we need you. They've always been part of NASA's history and, and the U.S. history because they're the storytellers. They paint the pictures. Who better to paint our picture of the journey to Mars than the artists and the storytellers, you know, the journalists. And um, I actually now do a lot, of, a lot of talks and speeches. I always put D on the end, steamed. Um, first, I'm pretty ticked off. I'm steamed. We are not making enough progress. Uh, quickly and you know it's urgent so we really need all in I need every girl and boy out there to say oh we can do that I see myself you know working on one of these projects so we need everyone you know we have to be very inclusive we can't filter people out just the opposite I think we need to filter everyone in to you know you know what what a better you know vocation and uh, again so just can't uh, speak enough to you know we have to be inclusive we need kind of all hands on deck to to work you know with all of us and um, so my shout out to the, the artists painting NASA's pictures uh, from Earth Observation. We actually have this wonderful book called uh, Earth as Art. Anyone know where this is in the world? Take a, take a guess. This one's hard. China, I'll be flying there uh, in a couple of days. How about this one? Any guesses? That's Algeria. This one, that's a really cold continent. Everyone should know that one. <laughs> Uh, still, but you know, beautiful, magical. Again, so uh, now everyone should know this too. 
Down south? South America? People? Huh? The Nazca. I think I heard it. Yeah. These are, these are from, from orbit. These are the Nazca lines in Peru. All right. Well, there you go. Andy Warhol even got into the, again, we all in, you know. These are, endur these are enduring, you know. These, these images stay with us. And uh, Eileen Collins was our first uh, female shuttle commander, and this is a photograph by Annie Leibowitz. So, you know, they've always been with us to tell our stories. So, um, anyhow, this is uh, the fun, uh, incredible job that I have every day to be able to, you know, talk to people about how we get, you know, humanity interplanetary and, and boots on Mars and by, we say, 2030s. So, I'm going to... Um, Finish my comments there, and uh, have some beautiful uh, images here. Uh, and I won't take any questions, uh, and just show you these beautiful images. This is a new IMAX movie, A Beautiful Planet. And uh, it just came out, hopefully it's open in the Bay Area. It's, do, do you guys know if it opened here? But maybe it hasn't opened up here. It just came, here's some, here's, it's, it's really beautiful, you know, uh, ultra high def images taken uh, by our astronauts on board. So thanks for your attention. What's, what's on your mind? Thank you so much for talking to us. Um, my question is about the uh, kind of interplay between NASA and uh, SpaceX with respect mm -hmm. to putting people on Mars. Um, so like in what ways do uh, NASA and SpaceX work together towards that goal, and in what ways do they do their own thing? Mm -hmm. And then also, what is uh, NASA's sort of uh, goal after we put people on Mars? Um, like SpaceX's is to actually colonize Mars and have sort of a backup of the human race. What does NASA want to do after we you know, are able to put researchers on Mars? Okay, so thanks, great question. So uh, we work together in partnerships. As I said, right now, um, we're, you know, SpaceX has given us cargo to space station, and then astronauts coming for the crew. And then in terms of a Red Dragon, um, don't you read my blog, right? <laughs> we extended our Space Act agreement uh, for that for EDL. Again, we're, we're all about the data, and let's get this right. And so we're in working in, in cooperation with SpaceX on, on Red Dragon to get that, uh, that EDL, the entry, descent, and landing data for, for larger masses. So that's what we're doing together today. It's so our huge investment, you know, again, from NASA uh, into SpaceX, because like I say, uh, we're counting on them to succeed. And uh, we're not in a competition at all. We're seeding, you know, it's this government funds going into, again, the, the private sector to make sure that they succeed. Now, um, you know, Elon's uh, vision of, of getting to, to Mars and people, that's great. Uh, you know, we as a government and, and the U.S. and we'll be there together. And there's really interesting uh, opportunities then. As I mentioned before, cargo and split missions and things like that. So we really do think, you know, then in the coming decades that people will be on Mars. Now it's a, from NASA's perspective, it's a round trip. Very important to call that out. And just so there's no community, so round trip. So we look at, you know, multiple, multiple missions and getting people, getting people there. But Go back to the enduring question for us again, it's to look for the past evidence of life. Kind of like being a fossil hunter, if you will. Our rovers are there, we're getting data every day, but was Mars once habitable? You know, and that, so for us there's also the big science drivers, you know, looking for past evidence of, of life. Now, um, if, uh, if uh, you know, uh, if Elon and Jeff are, you know, in competition with each other as well, that's a good thing. If that's friendly competition, but that's not the government. Again, we're, we're partnering with, with everyone and, and looking for everyone's success. So hopefully that, does that, that help answer? Yeah. Is there any concern about being reliant on one country, in this case Russia, given geopolitical tensions about them being the ones that are taking the astronauts up to the space station? Yeah, so um, great. The question, if, you know, what about uh, being reliant, um, you know, on, on the Russians for, for launch for, for astronauts? And... Um, they're great partners. I uh, would like to hold up, uh, this is soft diplomacy. It's my best example I can give you with, with tensions, political tensions in, in the world. But guess what? Uh, NASA, meaning the US and Russia, and um, we've been working together famously, dependent on one another for 16 years. So uh, we really, you know, we're held up as an example of what's going right. And it really is soft diplomacy and working together. We just figure out a way to do it. Given, you know, other politics, um, we just, we're in this together. We have great, we're, we're engineers and scientists, so these are great friends. I had my, I worked with the Russians since the 90s. Um, you know, we have three decades of great history, and even before that, you know, Apollo Soyuz, not lost, not lost on us. In the tension of the Cold War, you know, there's an astronaut and a Russian cosmonaut shaking hands. So we just look it up as an exemplar, and that's where we're interested in partnering in the future. We think it's a great partnership, but then when it comes to, you know, the economy and helping U.S. Um, 
businesses and things, well, we're all about that too. And that's what government, so that's why we're so excited about returning the launches back to US soil. And so that, again, it's nice to have a nice portfolio, but we'll be comfortable when uh, SpaceX and Boeing are launching our astronauts you know, back, um, back here from the Kennedy Space Center. So that's, that's how we look at it. Again, great partners, soft diplomacy, you know, great example. And then again, um, working with everyone we can. Thanks. What's your take on Mars One? <laughs> um, as I said, uh, the government, the government, we're doing a round trip, um, and uh, inspiration, good inspiration. I love the vision, uh, but you know, not credible. Uh, no funding, um, no, not the right technology. So, not you know, expertise. Um, great. Well, I'm, 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 good vision. You know, it's great to inspire. I like the inspire part. So in the 60s, there were a lot of there's a lot of excitement around the the space program with going to the moon and stuff. How do we build that same level of excitement today? Yeah, thanks for the question. This is where you know I am a former academic, so I'm going to start asking you guys questions. And this is, um, you know, that's what we really we I need to hear from you. You know, I can tell you what we're doing, citizen science, and we really want to take humanity with us. This is a, you know four fortunate astronauts, the first Mars explorers, and, and even the commercial guys, it's, it's still a very limited number of folks, right? So how do we open it up? How do we take everyone with us? So it's as compelling as the, the what did we just see? The tilt, the tilt brush that, you know, I was there. I was, in, I was just in 3D space. And, uh, you know, so how can we take the world with us? So we're really thinking about that for citizen science. Um, we're making these investments for all of humanity. And, you know, again, the Apollo heritage is, is so great that humanity really, uh, we won't be going and planting in a US flag. What we'll be doing is saying, hey world, you know, we're, we're here and we're doing this together. But we really want to hear from, from you all and uh, tell us how we can, you know, work together and take and open it up so that everyone feels like they're part of the mission because that's really our goal. Kind of part of every mission because I got to highlight a few we're doing 100 solar system missions right now. How many, how many aeronautics campaigns are we doing, Eugene? <laughs> dozens and dozens. So in my limited time, I don't get to tell you about the hundreds of, um, you know, it's a big portfolio. It's just so, so cool. But we want to open it up and have whatever people's interests are and passion, you know. So it might be climate. It might be flight. It might be something else. We want to say, hey, we're, we're open government. And we're trying to do a lot of these things in terms of innovation, open government, to make sure that everyone can participate. Because it's your tax dollars after all. How much will be happening just next door, and can we go see the planes when they visit? <laughs> you know, uh, and then also um, the 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 multi-propeller, yeah. hybrid electric models. I mean, are are you looking at full electric propulsion, no no petrochemicals at all for those? No, it's hybrid. What, what's it's looking at? Yeah, now? so it's it's hybrid electric, and I'll, I'll get uh, Eugene involved in here. There's a lot a lot is happening here at, at NASA Ames. What can, what can people see? <laughs> Don't know yet, but uh, the actual airplanes themselves I'm anticipating will be, will be tested down in Armstrong, uh, yeah. down in the Mojave Desert. But we will likely do quite a bit of wind tunnel testing up here, so models, scale models of them, or if, of course, uh, um, they need the uh, full scale test in the, in the largest wind tunnel, it could be full scale. Uh, also, um, we're likely here at Ames to be quite involved in much of the autonomy work right. related to them, um, much of the computational analysis with our supercomputers. Um, and so, so we do expect to see quite a bit of work related to these X-planes here at Ames. Whether you'll actually see the flight vehicles themselves up here or we'll have to get you down to yeah. Southern California, that that's, remains to be seen. Yeah, so Armstrong is, is our flight research center, but hopefully they'll come by and just buzz, buzz us a little bit. <laughs> you know, they give us a little wing tip or, or something like that. But yeah, it's, and so definitely West Coast, uh, you know, kind of investments, very exciting. It's been a, it's been a long time to get uh, this investment, you know, back to, to era where, where we should be just you know, to, to lead, to lead in these things. Really critical that the U.S. is making these investments in, in X-planes for the future. And it is, uh, just, to, just to make sure, you know, it's hybrid electric for the motors. That's, that's six, that's six, uh, Six motors on each wing, so that's twelve. That's twelve electric motors, but we always call it the hybrid electric, and um, it's the second out of the gates after the supersonic because we can do phase one right now, and then see. We're still. Um, um, that's my day job is uh, trying to trying to secure the NASA budget, so you know, see what we can get in terms of uh, support, and so we can keep going. But that's why we just announced on Friday, I think it was Friday, to do the phase one for the hybrid electrics, and then phase two is is much larger. But we, you know, no time. We got to get started. <laughs> I guess I have two questions. One is more sciencey, and one is more political. Since <laughs> NASA, Let's do is science this. first. <laughs> yeah. All right. So the, sci the sciencey one is this. So there's people who say, you know, like, why are we going all the way to Mars with humans? Why don't we do the Moon again first and train and whatnot, and only then do Mars? 
Yeah, so I'll take that first one. So um, again, you have those building blocks, that roadmap, we've said um, we're, we will be in Earth moon orbit, cis lunar. So we're going to the moon. We just, uh, we have to, uh, we have constrained budgets, uh, you know, <laughs> and um, so we're saying for our investments and technology, solar electric propulsion, deep space habitats, advanced life support systems, all these technologies we need to prove out in cis lunar and even deep space. But um, we're saying, hey world, if someone wants to lead and have a lunar lander, great, you know, I hope, then we'll get a NASA astronaut on board. You know, we'll take you out there. But we're saying for our investments, you know, you can't do it all. It's, it just gets too expensive. So we're saying we'll get you out there. We're going to, you know, be focused on our technology development, proving ground, and they get beyond. But uh, for sure, we're going to see humanity on the moon. And again, given this, that's what we're opening up is global exploration. So hopefully that's multi, you know, hopefully that's global, real global. We just can't lead in all those things. So that's, that's, that's what NASA, that's why our vision is Mars. Clearly, that's a horizon goal because um, it's so hard and never been done. And uh, again, we're going there to look for past evidence of, of life. So we're really clear about that. So does that, does that help? Yes, it does. It makes complete sense to me as well. Uh, now, the second, a little bit tougher question is, so NASA is a big organization. I mean, it covers... 17,500 also. Yes. Just, it, just it, down it from 18,000. It's still not as big as the United Nations, because I remember when I was working at the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees, it was 120,000 people. But, uh, you know, like, it is pretty big. So, and, and it, it does have aeronautics and space within it. And, you know, like, things seem to take a little bit longer time. You know, like, people say, you know, like, then they used to in the 60s. You know, like, there's people who say, like, oh, we just did a seat of the pants thing, you know, like, without so much analysis and whatnot. You know, like, we just tested things. You know, like, if they worked, you know, like, we went with them. You know, like, uh, some people complain about red tape. Some people complain about, you know, like, misuse of funding. Can you tell us a little bit, you know, like, you know, like the internal sort of scoop, but you know, like the sort of higher level scoop, like what are you guys doing? <laughs> what are we what doing? are you guys it's, doing to sort yeah. of you know, like counterbalance you know, like the growth and the the spreading of an administration? Because I think that lesson might be useful uh, here at Google as well. Okay, yeah, because the big and growth, and, and actually, so at NASA, we're, we're uh, reducing it. So it used to be 18,000, now civil servants actually 17, we're going down to 17,500. And again, you want, you want the best and the brightest, and you want to have these great challenges. That's how you get great people, same as Silicon Valley here. Uh, but it's important to know we can have three to one contractors too. So, so our family is not just the civil servants, uh, you know, really the, the numbers are, are much larger. And that's just kind of, we call, you know, kind of inside the gates, our, our contractors, not even our big contracts that we let out but our, you know, let's say brothers and sisters. So, so it is large. And, um, but again, we're trying to, we, we get that. And uh, when you're 50 year, you know, your bureaucracy, we have to say, hey, how can we do things? So the partnerships, as Ames is actually a great example. How can we do this? How can we, it's, it's hierarchical, you know, for a former academic, you know, no kidding. Um, you know, you come in, but you say, how can you be really successful? How can you still be lean? How can you do a mission like this and, and get it right? And to me, it comes down to innovation. And uh, so that's uh, not surprising that we're here at Google and, and other places. Um, and really, I think it's innovate or die. I mean, um, you know, so how do we get the technologies? And, um, you know, here's NASA's budget. There's other very large government budgets out there. You know, we're here. There's large ones. So we say, for us, it has to be very specific to NASA. You know, we have to invest in those te te technologies that only NASA should, because the rest of them, we, can, we should be able to get and partner with other agencies or with industry. And we have to change the organizational model. How do we change the organizational model to, to get this done? So we're on that, but again, that's what we're really uh, going out and talking to, to industry folks and, and saying, how do we, you know, what are new ways? Help us think about new ways to, to get this done. We're very cognizant of that, so it's, it's pretty exciting because we're also somewhere in history that I think is truly a crossroads. That, you know, NASA's been working on commercial space for a long time and a lot of different offices, and now we just know it's here to stay. So we're at this really incredible place in, in history that it's we just it's here to stay. And we think like low Earth orbit will be commercialized. Well, guess what? We're placing all our bets there because we need to get out into the, you know, we want to get to the moon and, and then get to Mars. So, um, but please, again, let's, you know, we, you guys are growing as well, growing, growing. So again, how to, how to do that and stay uh, innovative and, and efficient is right. uh, something, good lessons learned for, for government agencies as well. And probably just to put it in perspective so people don't take this as a negative thing. I mean, NASA is big, but you know, like, it's a minuscule you know, like in, in budget comparisons compared to, for example, you know, like the Department of Defense or some of the other agencies. Yeah, order order of magnitude less, yes. and then some. It's mm -hmm. like half percent, right? So we're right now um, less than 0.5 percent of right. the GDP. We're so. 0.48 or something like that. Apollo, we were five percent. 
Yeah, so in order, so we're, we're yeah. down in order of magnitude, so that's again, so we just, we, uh, and it's still a robust, you know, we're not complaining, we're, you know, fighting for every penny because we want to make these investments in Aero and, and we want to get this done. And we think within these budgets, if we do it, if we do it right and sustainable and affordable, we'll, we'll get there. It takes a little bit longer, of course, you know. Thank you for your talk. Uh, just a quick question to you. Did you consider sending animals to Mars? You know, early early test flights again with the Russians and and the U.S. Both um, you know some animals. Now, in terms of the the biology and the physiology, we actually fly animal models up in up in space station today. Uh, we use it as uh, even you know little quadrupeds, you know, <laughs> mouse and yep rodent rodent models, and uh, figure out how they're doing in the weightless environment. And we get to Mars, of course, we have gravity again. So it's this really interesting three year plus mission where essentially you go out with conventional you know. Uh, you know, rocket propellant, about eight months there, say two year round trip, let's call it, take the short leg out, and then 600 days on the surface of Mars, and we're, so three ace gravity when you get to Mars. But, um, so we learn, we learn from, from animal studies and, and rodents and things like that. But um, right, you know, right now it's more, that's the scientific research. They're not uh, the critical, not the critical path to, to, getting, to getting the astronauts there. But we're learning a lot. Muscle, I'll give you a couple examples, like musculoskeletal, um, so bone loss up on space station, uh, one, one to two percent per month of bone mineral density loss. Now you want to do on your one-year mission <laughs> for Scott Kelly? Well, he doesn't have that much bone loss because we're exercising, we call them countermeasures, so exercising and things like that. So cardiovascular, not a problem, uh, neurovestibular, you know, you might be sick for a few days, that's okay if you're up there a year, um, but um, we have a new something, a new phenomena, um, VIP. So we have, a, we have a visual, we have interocular pressure that's really causing some, some visual, not with all of our astronauts, but with some of them, and especially some of the veterans. What's that? So we are on it, figuring out, um, you know, we have to make sure people have good vision, and what's this interocular pressure? Because you're in microgravity and the fluid shift, and probably pressing on, you know, the eighth cranial nerve and things like that, and so we're thinking about how do we deal with that can't be sending people, you know, on this long duration Mars mission until we, you know, figure that out. And that, that's a new one just in the last few years. But so some of these, this physiology, again, so when we look at something like that, uh, and radiation for our astronauts is the number one, the number one, radiation protection. So again, thinking about how you do that. How do you do radiation protection? We're in low Earth orbit on station. That's kind of nice and protected. So we got to figure this out. You know, we, we're going to be being literally bombarded by the galactic cosmic rays. So we need radiation protection. And that's, again, the proving ground. We learn a lot more about that. Um, Curiosity, the Mars um, MSL, our current rover, has this cool experiment called RAD on it for radiation. And, uh, but it was really great. We turned it on on its mission out to Mars. So we took, we got a radiation profile all the way out to Mars, and it's still working today on Mars. So again, every day we're learning more about the radiation environment on, on Mars. But uh, we really have to protect, um, again, all the electronics <laughs> as well as the people. Hi, Dr. Newman. Thanks for the talk. Sure. Um, so I forget the, the term for this concept, but there's, there's a concept related to um, the, the quantity of satellites that you have in orbit. And at mm -hmm. some point, you reach saturation, and they start colliding and chain reacting. Um, I, this seems like a really big concern, especially as the, uh, the number of satellites that we're putting up is accelerating, um, yeah. as the number of launches that we're having is accelerating with satellite, internet, and uh, cable, and so forth. Um, is there a research team at NASA looking into how to deal with this sort of thing? Yeah, so we look at orbital debris, and um, especially in low Earth orbit, and you can take there's some good images, and they probably are shocking if you haven't looked at you know, low Earth orbit. So there's, there's a lot of stuff, which is great. I mean, it's good that it's busy, but again, uh, just take low Earth orbit, and uh, you know, it's going 17,500 miles per hour, so a, a little fleck, a little paint chip is like a serious bullet that can rip through you know, our, our you know, solar panels. And we get, we get nicks on space station since it is so big. We have, you know, we get nicked in every station that's up there. So a couple things. In terms of orbital debris, interestingly enough, this is, gets really into the policy area of things because we need international agreement and treaties because it's not just us. You know, it's not just NASA. It's not just the U.S. This is really international space. So interesting to think about governance and um, orbital debris now. And it also puts a premium to me, you know, as an engineer, the, the thrusters and how you deorbit, ton of CubeSats going out there. They're great, they're small, everyone can do it. Um, but, you know, let's, uh, and they'll burn up, they're nice, I mean, small, you know, six, six you, you know, unit. But we gotta make sure that, you know, they, can we, can we deorbit them? 
do they burn up? And can we have some, you know, you, use, you have thrusters and that's how you adjust you know, your attitude basically when you're up there. And so it really kind of puts a premium on, on that aspect of it. Uh, you know, US Space Command just tracks um, a centimeter. I think it's just one centimeter and above. Um, other smaller particles and things like that are not. So it's a great question uh, as that we get more populous. And, and then again, geo, we go up to geo orbit. Well, guess what? A lot of people like to go to geo as well because that's great for Earth observations and it's great for spy satellites. So, you know, as we, as we do this, but uh, to the point, so we have, you know, we think about it a lot. There's a lot of studies done. So NASA is very active, but what happens is we have to engage, you know, we are engaged. Um, I just was at the UN uh, last week and that's on the, the committee on the use, uh, the peaceful uses of outer space. So we're talking about long-term sustainability and talking with the world literally about, about these kind of issues, um, orbital debris, planetary protection, things like that. Thank uh, Dave and Yuan for visiting Google. Thank you, guys. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank you. My pleasure.